Childhood is far away, beneath a tree, playing with pebbles, skillfully tossing them from back of hand to palm, requiring a certain skill and magical ritualistic incantations. As one grows older, the pebbles grow too, into great stones and rocks hurled with violence, smashed skulls, spilled brains splattering the pavements. In the month of July, a man fled from his pursuers. He climbed a tree. The mob aimed stones at him until they got him down. Probably fell off, his grasp loosened, slippery with blood, his body already battered. And then they trampled him to death. Welcome to the Art Gallery of Mississauga, Border Crossing, a journey through the lands of our lives. I'm Dave Ramsmeyer, your curator at the AGM, and this is In Conversation with Francis Ferdinands. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today, Francis. I have to first off start by saying how honored we are that you've shared this collection with us and this installation. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to have it shown here. You know, we've, we've seen it in so many different reincarnations and reimagined so many different ways in different galleries across the country. This installation, 26, can you share with us where did this come from? What inspired it? 26 is an installation that memorializes the 26-year civil war in Sri Lanka, my homeland, which began in July 1983 and ended in May 2009. Just as background, Sri Lanka is comprised of two major ethnic groups, the Buddhist Sinhalese, which comprise about 70% of the population, and the Hindu Tamils, about 20% of the population. It began with riots in the capital city of Colombo with targeted attacks on the Tamils. These tensions between these two groups have a long history, dating back to the legacy of British colonialism, whose tactics in governing was divide and rule. So there were large inequalities of power and privilege. The installation is meant to be a statement of hope a celebration of peace and the power of beauty. And it begins with a poem, the month of July, which describes the war's beginning very eloquently. It's by the renowned poet and writer, Jean Arasenaigam, who was born a Dutch burger, like me, but she married a Tamil, and by that was thrown into the situation. Following the poem are tree branches affixed to the wall, and underneath are rounded beach stones from the ocean, chosen for their beauty. The slippers which follow number 26 and take us to the end of the war. So the poem and the slippers are like bookends to the war. Now, Francis, can I ask you, why slippers? Can you explain that archetype to our audience? In 2015, I was fortunate to travel back home to Sri Lanka on an OAC grant to study temple mural painting and bobbin lace making, both arts and crafts hardly practiced and culturally at risk. During my three month stay, I visited many Buddhist temples and as you enter the grounds of the temple, you must remove your footwear. I noticed that almost entirely the footwear was comprised of slippers. Slippers are ubiquitous in Sri Lanka, probably because of the intense heat. Slippers are also very democratizing and egalitarian. So I decided to use that as symbolic of a person, foot touching slipper, which in turn touches Mother Earth. The war touched everyone, regardless of ethnicity, age, and gender. So for me, it was a fitting symbol and then I hand decorated each pair with designs based on traditional Sri Lankan patterns. Thank you, Francis. Now 26 slippers, one for each year symbolizing the Sri Lankan Civil War. Is there any reason in particular why it's women's slippers and why a size seven? It's a common size 
To quote Goldilocks from, you know, the Three Bears story, not too big, not too small, just right. Why a woman's slipper? I'm a woman. Incidentally, most of them were purchased in the PETA, which is the huge market in Colombo, and many at Bata Shoes in the PETA. Isn't that curious? A Canadian company? Francis, now we've, we've seen this installed before at commercial galleries at Artichoke, uh, the Gallery of Stratford, Station Gallery in Whitby, where you've worked with the curators to come up with a, a unique rendition each and every time. Can you share a bit about your experience having 26 installed so many various ways as an artist, seeing it reimagined, reinterpreted each time? What is that like for you? And what is that like for the piece? Now, the fourth time this installation has been exhibited since 2015 when it was created. Each time I like to get input from whomever I'm working with. The art gallery director, the curator, the installer, all of these people because the arrangement can change depending on the conditions and the room. In its first incarnation, they were arranged in pairs together, forming an undulating sine wave path on the wall. A sine wave is a continuous, repeated wave. It also alludes to sound waves, which of course the slippers make when you're walking. The second time at Gallery Stratford, the path was in a stepping motion, going from the wall to the floor and back to the wall. The third time at Station Gallery, the slippers went off in many directions and some were in clumps and others solitary, a more kind of mixed group and individualistic thinking approach. This time, we were thinking of taking a cue from the tree branches and continuing the idea of branches. It's exciting for me to have something like this that's open to reinterpretation and expansion on the ideas put forth by consulting and working with others. It keeps the work fresh. Feed me, free me. It's such an intentional piece, Francis. Can you share a bit about that work with us? Yeah, the slippers lead into uh, the painting, Feed Me, Free Me. The painting was done actually about a decade before the slippers and expresses very simply and directly the importance of feeding the physical body first and then feeding the intellect and spirit. So I've depicted an empty rice bowl, which again harkens back to the war when many were deprived of food. On the right is a portion of a seated Buddha in lotus position, presumably meditating. As an aside, thinking about the war, where were all these Buddhist monks during the war? In the upper right region, a hand is holding a bird. Is it tame? Is it captive? Is it about to be released from captivity? To me, the potential for the bird symbolizes a physical and spiritual release. After the war, many were put into camps for years or disappeared entirely. So the bird is symbolic to me of the potential for freedom. Next, we have a piece called Deafening, a poignant, powerful, and provocative mixed media inspired by the Memento Mori style of Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio's Basket of Fruit. Known as one of the first works of Baroque art, what does that piece mean to you and to 26? Disasters and death come in all shapes and sizes. Memento Mori literally means remember you must die. It is a genre of art throughout history that illustrates the inevitability of death. On the left is a portion of a Caravaggio painting with its worm-eaten apples and withering leaves. It's a companion to the photo collage. In this case, it's something called an image transfer where I technically transfer the image onto a gel and then affix it to the painting. The image transfer is of a wailing man holding his dead child. 
This could easily have been a photo taken from Sri Lanka's civil war, but it's not. It's a photo I took from the Globe and Mail newspaper the day after the tsunami of Boxing Day 2004, which hit Sri Lanka and killed over 30,000 people and left over 100,000 homeless. I call it deafening because his silent scream of intense grief to me is deafening. That piece, its meaning and its symbolism deafens my brain, calms it down, and allows me to actually hear the message through it. It is visually, mentally, and emotionally deafening. Thank you for sharing that piece with us. It's a piece in, in my private collection um, that will never be sold because it has great, even as I speak, it has great emotional content for me. Uh, I, I was heavily involved in the tsunami relief effort and so know about many of these people that lost their homes and who died. Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, a spiritual referencing the prophet Elijah and his ascension into the heavens on a chariot of fire from the Old Testament. What does this mean to 26 and how is it translated in this piece? Elijah was a prophet and a miracle worker around the 9th century BC. He defended the worship of the Hebrew God against other gods. He could raise the dead, he could bring down fire from the sky, and he was rewarded by entering heaven alive on a chariot of fire. How is that for a story? Given that story, my reference for this painting was actually not the story of Elijah, but the hymn that emanated from that story. And so it's more grounded in the Afro-American Negro spiritual hymn called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And I think uh, rather than being a story about Elijah, it's really a hymn about anyone who is troubled or oppressed, um, that they have that ability to rise from the world to a better place. So let me just read a couple of stanzas from the hymn. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what do I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. If you get there before I do, come forward to carry me home. Tell all my friends I'm coming to. Come forward to carry me home. So in its relation to 26, this painting is the hymn of a war victim. Sri Lanka being an island in the Indian Ocean, it's home to numerous poor fishermen with their ramshackle wooden boats or catamarans. The chariot, in this case, is the old battered hulk of a boat's skeleton, which holds in its belly a shimmering seashell, its symbolic heart. It's rising. It's being lifted out of the water, angels pulling the ropes, carrying it home. The bird in the upper left, again for me, is the soul being released from the body, journeying to a better place. Come forth to carry me home. Tell my friends I'm coming too. In reference to the show this season, Border Crossings, A Journey Through the Lands of Our Lives, can you share with us how Swing Low Sweet Chariot speaks to that, speaks to 26, and the passages through our lives? It's a very troubled world that we live in. And I think that this hymn really speaks to people that are oppressed uh, for being an ethnic minority, being a race that is not appreciated, uh, living in poverty unnecessarily. I think 
there are so many issues that this hymn speaks to. And I think it's very pertinent for this time, actually, 2020. Thank you, and thank you for sharing with us that, that very important message as marginalized people we know all too well what you're referencing, that discrimination or not being appreciated for something as simple as the shade or the gender you identify with or anything as such that separates you from what people will accept. Um, I do want to ask about the boat because I see that moving forward, we see the boat in your work. Can you speak to why that is important with passages? The boat as a metaphor for a transition and it can be a physical transition from one country to the other, or in many cases, I see it as a spiritual transition, that um, we are moving spiritually to a better place. And so the boat symbolizes that for me. So that journey, border crossings, a journey through the lands of our lives, that boat, doesn't necessarily mean through the lens of our physical lives, but that border crossing could be into the life that we don't see beyond. Yes. Excellent. Now, I, I do want to, as it, as it sort of leads us into the next piece, Passages, which is a very interesting one, um, beyond its connection to 26, which I would further like you to explain, I also want to reference the fact that it is visibly much more abstract than the previous three, which seemed much more intentional. Can you speak to the intuitiveness of that piece? Passages, um, chronologically, is a later piece. I think it was done in 2012, something like that. I think as, if you happen to see my current work, it is totally intuitively based. So I have evolved over uh, the years from being um, very uh, politically, socially idea-based in my work to working rather intuitively and seeing where things go. So this is kind of an early um, incarnation of that process. It relates to 26, as I am a Sri Lankan immigrant, immigrant and was raised in Toronto within a culturally South Asian household. Passages is more of an autobiographical mixed media work in which pieces of my history are recounted. Because of the nature of the work, it was approached more intuitively. The title refers to the physical crossing coming to Canada and the passage of leaving childhood and entering adolescence. We came to Canada on two ocean liners, and it took over a month, hence the boat motif. My mother sold all my clothes until I was about 15, so I've embedded several paper patterns within the work. There's a portion of a vest, blouse, whose border is a paisley pattern motif, alluding to my roots. I had a long plait or braid until I was about 12 when I had it cut off. This braid is made from steel wool, steel wool, which alludes to strength and endurance. And as the boat is also a marker of transition, crossing from childhood to adolescence. The chair's there because I've always felt somewhat of an outsider and observer to both Sri Lankan and Canadian culture. Wait, so those are sewing patterns that I see? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, Butterick, simplicity, vogue, yes. So, seamlessly, see what I did there? <laughs> Leading to our next piece, Elegy ends off 26. Can you conclude this installation with what Elegy is all about? Yeah. An Elegy is a serious reflection. It can be a reflection on the death of a close friend, or a reflection on our journey or destiny as humans. This painting is the latter. It's a somber piece containing several paper clothing pattern shapes referring to the human body. One portrays a tombstone shape, 
but it's made from a paper pattern of a sleeve, overlaid with a piece of lace that makes it mask-like, reflecting on the inevitability of death for all of us. On the upper right, a burst of color, a bright flower shape, a symbol of life. The boat motif, this time it's a kayak, is another reflection on life's journey. This piece brings 26 full circle as it contains a beautiful round beach stone that in some cultures like Judaism, people bring and lay a stone at a grave. Some say to keep the soul grounded here in this world, others that it symbolizes the permanence of memory and that memories will not die. For me, this symbolizes the permanence of memory. And so by having the stone as part of the painting and then the actual stone presented before it, almost in an attitude of worship or reverence, it pays homage to the poem. The slippers, the related paintings, and brings the installation full circle. With that said, elegy looks a bit like a poetic eulogy. What would you say to that? The words are very close in actuality and in meaning. Um, and I, I agree. Um, it is in some ways an eulogy. I'm eulogizing a brutal war which took so many lives and wrecked so many lives. But at the same time, I'm saying, look, honor what we all possess. We possess the power of beauty. We possess the strength of spirit. And we possess a possibility of a future that can be different from the past. So in that sense, I am eulogizing. I'm going to read a quote here from legendary author, first of his kind, James Baldwin. Um, in his 1963 book, The Fire, Next Time, he says, Love takes, us, takes off masks we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. With intuitive art, it can be very difficult to explain, but can you elaborate on the mask in that piece? What does it mean to you, and when do you feel you can remove those masks? I don't think I can elaborate on the mask in that particular piece. Um, that was a very intuitive um, move to affix the lace onto that shape. And after I'd done it, I realized I had transformed that shape into a mask. And um, up until that time, the sleeve for me was a very tombstone kind of shape and then by putting the lace on top it changed it entirely and it felt right. I can't describe why but it needed to be there and sometimes you do things because they need to be there and they're right. Yeah. But to answer James Baldwin which is very difficult a state of being, a state of grace is what I desire as an artist to be in and in turn to be reflected in my work. Being in a state of grace is being in my studio, giving into the work and trusting that it will take me on a journey that starts with me and ends with me. The work being honest and true and the outcome not manipulated or forced but accepted for its authenticity and its possibility for revelation. Being in the studio is a process of unmasking. It's a place that no one else can dictate to you, overrule you, criticize you, or demean you. 
If the work is honest and authentic, you have unmasked yourself. You are honoring yourself, your thoughts, your feelings, your intellect, and you're in a place of love. You are at home. That is a state of grace. Before we go in the grand tradition of one of my inspirators, James Lipton, and before him, Marcel Proust, I would like to ask a few questions that I want to end off each in conversation with. Are you ready for it? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is your favorite sound? I don't have one, but I love the sound of ocean waves crashing. I love the sound of a tabla. I love the sound of a unaccompanied solo um, cello playing a box suite. I love a Spanish guitar. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you. Now, who is your favorite hero, real or fictional? I don't have one. Again, I gravitate towards a flawed but endearing comical characters. So if I have to name a couple, um, I would say John Cleese in Faulty Towers and Rowan Atkinson in Blackadder. I have watched those series a million times and can watch them another million times. I think they are brilliant, brilliant people, brilliant actors. I love them both. What is your idea of joy? I would say um, my two most favorite activities are uh, beach combing for shells and stones. Uh, many of the stones in this installation have come through my beach combing experiences. And uh, second to that is walking through woods looking for sticks. Excellent. If not a full-time studio artist, what would you do? I would be a badass interior decorator. I just know I would be great at it. <laughs> In one phrase, describe your truth. Well, I, t I don't have a, <laughs> a phrase at hand, but I do love the line. I don't know who invented it. Be yourself, everyone else is taken. Everyone else is taken, thank you. And as we look at your work, we see from the beginning to the end of 26, moving from intentional to intuitive and allowing that to speak through you. We also see references to your past and to your ancestors. So to sum up the interview, I wanna ask, if you're sitting up there with the ancestors, with the divine, with God, with the spirit, whatever you want to call it, sipping a cup of chai, what would you like them to say to you? She makes a great cup of chai. And there you have it, Francis. It was such an <laughs> honor and a pleasure to work with you on this installation. 26 can be seen as part of Border Crossing, a journey through the lands of our lives now at the gallery at the Art Gallery of Mississauga. Thank you for joining us for another In Conversation With. This has been Dave Ramsmeyer, your curator at the Art Gallery of Mississauga, and we are joined with Francis. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.